Hi, uh, my name is Lawrence, and I'll be uh, today, tomorrow, and Wednesday, I'll be talking to you about software transactional memory. Um, and to get your interests primed, what is software transactional memory? It's like garbage collection esque concurrency control. But that's getting ahead of ourselves a bit. Let's first. Uh, First, I want to introduce myself and know who the people in the audience are. So I've personally dabbled with Haskell since 2014, where I met it at a university course. Um, I love to talk about it. It, it, it. It's one of my favorite languages. And I'm currently doing development at this company in Utrecht, the Netherlands, called Chanable, and we use it in production there. Uh, we also have Python. Um, it's been there for one and a half years. I didn't introduce it myself, but a couple of my friends did. And um, yeah, that's been growing. Um, and it's been pretty nice. So in production, we use Haskell for uh, a couple of things. We uh, do job scheduling. Uh, we've written some CLI utilities. One of them is open source. Our main ingress and uh, into our data, uh, in, into our network is written in Haskell. Uh, we have a WebSocket-enabled document store, which we use for push notifications to our uh, front-end clients, which is also open source. You can check that out if you want. Uh, and our main data processing is currently written in Scala, but we're rewriting it in Haskell uh, because of some unrelated things. But this is sort of the, the background that, uh, that Haskell at Chanable. I've worked on not everything. I've worked on the CLI tooling, job scheduling, and the reverse proxy. Um, and that's the background I'm, uh, I have here. Uh, and there's some SDM stuff sprinkled around the code base. My interest is largely personal, uh, also professional, but uh, yeah, let's get to it. So who are you? Um, I'd like to know <laughs> before I uh, get into this. Um, who's been using Haskell uh, for more than a year? Who's been using it in production? <laughs> sort of. All right. <laughs> um, cool. And uh, who has seen SDM before? All right. All right. Uh, in that case, some of this might be a little slow. Um, just. Tell me when, whenever there's, whenever I should speed up or whenever I should uh, slow down a bit. Um, some of the goals of what I'm gonna try and talk to you about. Um, I'm gonna introduce the problems that SDM solves. Uh, tell you when and why SDM can help you if you're having problems, and discuss some implementation notes. And we're gonna spread this out over uh, today, tomorrow, and Wednesday. So today is mainly gonna be um, me giving context and introduction, and afterwards we're gonna write some code. I've got some exercises prepared. Um, and I might do some interactive stuff and let you present your findings, but I might also not. If you're not comfortable with that, we won't. Also, the stuff from for Wednesday isn't really set in stone. I am planning to discuss some operational semantics of SDM um, and the implementation notes, but uh, if you're not interested in that, let me know and I'll adjust accordingly, pick something else. All right. The lay of the land. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing, uh, is there a problem anyway? Um, there's two definitions, concurrent and parallel. The first is a property of your program and the parallel is a property of the machine. So your program can be concurrent in the sense that it consists of different work items that can, in theory, be executed concurrently and the parallelism thing that actually happens when it runs on a computer. So it also means that steps can happen at the same time and the parallel means things actually run at the same time. So this is a matter of potential versus realization. Um, so why care about this? Uh, speed, in some sense, on multi-core machines. Um, and there's also UX and fault tolerance and some other concerns that might be interesting, but um, more than one. Yeah. 
um, that that's a different like uh, that's a different concern, and that's a bit more of the Erlang style world where you have concurrency, which gets restarted in the sense that you have a robust application that's resilient across uh, against bugs. Um, but that's not going to be covered today. But we can talk about that later. Um, I think we need to invest in concurrency and concurrent programs. We live in a post Moore's law world. We're hitting limits of transistor size and power that they can consume. Um, and if we're going to write faster programs, which we want, we need to care about multi-core, I think. So that's a bit of the motivation. But the potential that I talked about has some perils. Um, most programs use and transform data, and we call this state, this configuration of data in a program. Um, different configurations mean different states, and these states can be very large. Um, our view of the world, that depends on program state. And this view of the world can be inconsistent depending on what, uh, where you're looking from. Different cores, different threads, they can have a different view of the world. And we want consistent views, atomic updates, and isolated transactions. And if you're uh, into this bit, then you might miss durability to make the asset like fully complete. Um, we're concerned with memory and not with storage, so we're not discussing durability, but we're discussing this. Hmm? Hmm. Yeah, we can. Hmm. But that's expensive, and it's not. I, I <laughs> anyway, we want this, and we don't necessarily have magic NVM hardware. <laughs> Yes. Um, so consistency is where, uh, um, let's see, let's start with isolation. Um, the isolation is where two parts of a program are modifying the same piece of memory. Their effects should not overlap. They should not be uh, affecting each other. Uh, consistency is where you always see the final result of a transaction. So you don't uh, see intermediate states, that kind of stuff. Um, and I'll get down into what this means in code in a bit. But we want this. So, but state is annoying. And the question is, what do we do with it? Um, that depends on our concurrency model. And a concurrency model is the way in which we reason about our concurrency. Um, and I'll discuss two. Uh, there's shared memory and message passing. And the first is uh, they, they can be typified as uh, different threads communicate by sharing, or they, commu uh, they share by communicating. Uh, traditionally, the first one means uh, multiple threads write to the same memory locations, and the second one means uh, we copy data a bit. And there is implementations in languages where this is slightly different, but uh, uh, this is the basic gist. But we're interested in sharing and mutation, but the problem is this can be difficult and annoying. And to show you how this can be difficult and annoying, um, let's do a bit of an exercise. I'm going to show you a very contrived example, and then you can point out what's wrong with it. It's not going to be in Haskell. It's going to be in some fictitious imperative language. but. I think it makes the, it gets, the, hmm? whatever you, whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. It's this, we're doing a bank account. And I apologize to all the people working at banks because it bank, yes, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> mm -hmm. But for, yeah, so I know, <laughs> I know, but this is, one of the one of the things that we're going to discuss, we're going to have two accounts, and we're going to attempt to transfer money with them uh, between them. Um, and um, we're going to credit one account and debit the other account. Simple, right? Uh, transfer money. All right. What's the problem with this code once you? try to execute this function across multiple threads. Yes. Yeah. 
one of the <laughs> very many things that can be wrong with this one. Yeah, I'm. Um, so this doesn't work. We can uh, have, uh, we can see intermediate states, for example. There might be another function which reads the balance of uh, an account. And if it reads it at this point, then uh, it might see an inconsistent state of the world. It might, uh, from the perspective of an observer, um, Uh, yeah, th there's more, uh, but uh, in this case, it, yeah, we can do some domain validation, that kind of stuff. Like, you cannot transfer money in the same account, and there, there, there's a bunch more problems. But one of them that I'm interested in discussing now is that if you read at this point uh, the to account and also read the from account, there's suddenly more money in the system than was previously there, and that is the one of the guarantees that's uh, uh, of the invariance that we want our system to have. Always have the same amount of money in the system. All right, so that one was wrong. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> introduce some locks, right? This is, this is how we do stuff. Um, we have two accounts, and we also assume that any routine which reads the balance from these accounts uh, also does lock them. Um, so we lock both accounts and then to and from and yeah, we credit and debit. Should be good, right? Nope. Um, there is a debt lock trap in this code where if you have two creds which try to transfer money in the opposite directions, uh, they end up acquiring these locks in this specific order and then the other thread ends up waiting for a lock that never gets released because the other thread is waiting uh, for the lock as well. So this breaks. So we need to decide on some global locking order, right? Um, based on our domain, we could, like, if we have account IDs, we could decide the lowest account ID goes first. And then we have some global locking order. All right, good. Um, and then this should not fall into this trap. But there are some other problems here as well. We need to actually remember to lock everywhere. And we need um, to think about what happens in case of an error, because we haven't talked about this yet. And if you um, then go at this, uh, oh, first, sorry. Uh, one, of, one of the problems here, maybe, um, the from account doesn't have enough balance, right? Um, so this might throw an exception. We don't know. We haven't looked at the implementation at all. Uh, and if this throws an exception, we've already written to some uh, other account. So in this transaction, we need to undo this work. And we need to remember this. Uh, and we need to do this. So um, in this case, that's all right, we can do this. But uh, if your program gets more complex and you've got a bunch of logic, then remembering whatever came first in your, um, in your program and having to undo that and having to undo that for complex if statements and that kind of stuff, uh, it's not going to be lots of fun. It's going to be pretty, pretty bad. I, don't, I wouldn't want to be responsible for this. So two hours later, or two years later, or however many time later, assume you have a perfect transfer function, right? Uh, it's great. It's the best thing since sliced bread. Um, all right. Then how do we use it? In a nested transaction with complex logic, and without causing problems, and without knowing anything about it, internals. I'd say you can't because you need to know about whatever locks and locking order uh, 
a certain function uses in order to not cause debt loss. Um, and you need to know how it reasons about its invariance and how it signals errors and how it does a whole bunch of other things. And this means, yeah, this, this is a bitty, pretty, you, you need to have this knowledge and this is a bad place because uh, your control flow of your program, it gets sort of gets inverted or flipped upside down, if you will, because you need to acquire all the resources before you actually um, actually can do something with them. So I'd say that concurrent code, when written like this, is where your composition of valid things goes to die, your encapsulation goes to die, and your sanity goes to die as well. So is there a light at the end of the tunnel is the question. Um, and depending on what trade-offs you're willing to make, uh, I'd say uh, STM can have an answer to the problems I just discussed. There must be a better way because it's 2018 and why do we still have these problems, right? We had problems like this with memory management where we use malloc and free manually and most of us, or at least I don't in my daily work, uh, use these uh, man manual memory management techniques. So garbage collectors are a thing which tackle this problem and they're used very successfully. So can we get the computer to take care of our locking? Is there a sort of garbage collection-esque automatic uh, way of handling locks like this? Uh, and what would it look like? Um, I'm introducing a new magic keyword to our language. It's called atomically. And um, this uh, means everything goes right. This is all we need to do. Yeah, so um, the code in atomically has all the properties we want. It has the atomic, isolate, uh, it has atomicity, isolation, and uh, consistency. So in technical terms, everything appears as if it's executing serially, but it's executing uh, at the same time, potentially. And this is very nice, um, but this doesn't exist. So, because I made it up. So let's switch to some code you can, or you can actually run. Um, and it looks like this, and this is Haskell. Um, we write our transfer function using uh, uh, two new type, uh, two type aliases I defined, and um, this is where we first see SDM. We define an SDM transaction. We have a from account and we have a to account and we have an amount we want to transfer between these. Um, and if we want to do that, we first credit and then debit, right? Uh, we've seen this. Um, besides this, you're going to need some imports. And that's the control concurrent STM uh, one that you need to import. And you also need to import data decimal. Um, our account type alias is called a, is, is an alias for tvar decimal. Um, and tvar is provided by the STM module. It means transactional variable. Yes. Uh, no, it's not safe to assume this works when we store it in durable memory. So this is in-memory uh, ephemeral stuff, uh, and the implementation works for uh, uh, for that. That's a very good question, uh, and I'll discuss that in a bit, um, or I can discuss it now. If, uh, the atomically function it takes an SDMA and puts it and turns it into an I/O action. Um, 
the reason we want to do this is because in a bit we'll see that there is a way to compose SDM actions and there isn't a way to compose IO actions. And I'll get into what composition means. Um, so to finish this example, uh, this uh, the foo and bar are accounts and there are tvars and this is the way we can uh, create tvars. Um, and then we atomically transfer from foo to bar 300 euros, body, uh, whatever you want. Um, and this actually runs, uh, the which is amazing, but we still have to, uh, uh, let, so let's discuss the semantics, right? Atomically um, takes an STM action and returns an IO action. And external observers never view intermediate states. We don't have the problem where uh, if there's a, a read of the, um, of one of the accounts in between the debit and the credit steps that there's, um, that there's not going to be an issue because of reasons we'll see in a bit. Uh, transactions happen successfully if there aren't any conflicting changes to the same variables. Uh, and STM retries the transaction if there are any conflicts. So how do we know about conflicts? When is that? Yes. You, it's a form of optimistic concurrency control. So uh, you retry until you succeed. Yeah. So how do we know about this? Well, we keep an access log. Uh, and we record reads and writes in this access log for uh, every uh, variable, and it's read local. Uh, hmm? Yes, and yeah, we'll get to retry. Uh, and before a block inside atomically commits and actually its effects bef become visible, we check the log of for all involved TFARs and see if there's any conflicts. And two transactions conflict when they're write sets overlap, meaning they write to the same uh, variables, or uh, the write set overlaps with a read set of another transaction right away. Um, it doesn't matter if they write the same, the same value, they, uh, they get retried. So how do we retry a transaction? Well, we jump to the start and try again uh, with everything changed until we succeed. And the reason this is important is because then we don't have to worry about undoing everything in the, in, in the logic we wrote. This is a retry when there is a conflict, yes. Yeah, there's also a retry combinator, uh, which you can call um, as the programmer yourself. Yeah, we'll get to it. Um, and the retry of a transaction helps for conflicts if there isn't a lot of contention to the same variables. And by contention, I mean uh, multiple uh, act, uh, threads, actors, uh, write to the same variables. Uh, you can imagine if there is a lot of uh, access on the same pieces of memory, then this isn't really helpful because you end up retrying a bunch and you might be better off if your data model looks like that, you actually go back to the, the locking or uh, change your data model uh, so you don't have this problem. Um, and retrying is also the error handling uh, mechanism with SDM, which works sort of the same way. Um, from now, let's discuss the implementation of debit and credit. Uh, and debit is the interesting one because for debit, we want to um, we, we can write this naively, but we don't check if someone has enough balance in this case, right? So uh, we have an account and an amount we want to debit, and then uh, we read the, the variable, the, the value, the balance of the account, and then we write uh, the balance uh, subtracted by the amount, right? And credit is the same, and then we write plus instead of minus. So we don't have the the if expression for uh, what happens if someone doesn't have enough money. 
and it looks like this. Same deal, uh, if, but if the balance minus the amount is, uh, ends up smaller than zero, then we retry and otherwise we can just write everything. Um, and this is a different form of retry. Or it, it, it's the same mechanism, but I'll specify it. But it's uh, called by the, the programmer, so I'll specify that in a bit. The semantics from for retry, as in the keyword, are retry the entire transaction from the start. Uh, and there's an asterisk here because uh, we're going to see how we uh, do alternative transactions in a bit, and that changes the semantics slightly. But retry ensures we don't have to manually, as a programmer, undo all the previous work we did in a transaction. We don't have to remember, uh, all right, I'm debiting someone's account, but they don't have enough money, so did I uh, credit someone else before? Uh, do I have to undo that? Uh, that problem disappears in this case. And the idea is here that you just rerun the transaction if there is a conflict from the start with the new uh, state of memory as an input. And then if there's another conflict, you do so again. And if there's another, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this retry, um, you might imagine, um, ends up in a sort of uh, with a naive implementation, it might end up in a in a busy loop. So you have uh, an account, and uh, say I have a thousand euros, but I want to buy a Ferrari because I really like Ferraris, uh, and that costs me a million something. And our program is going to run uh, if it just naively retries every time uh, we hit this point, then yeah, we're going to be stuck buzzy waiting until I have enough money to buy a Ferrari, which is, let's face it, going to take some time. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's not very smart, and there is something else that we can do. And it requires some extensions to the, the runtime, uh, and in Haskell this is implemented in this way. So the runtime only retries when some of the inputs of a transaction change, and that's to avoid this busy wait problem. Um, and sometimes we don't want to do that. We don't want to retry perpetually. We, our domain can have transactions which uh, are never going to complete. Um, so how do we handle that? Well, um, there is this thing which is called or else, uh, and it can be used to compose to STM transactions. And it means um, first try this transaction. If it fails or if it retries then uh, ex ex explicitly by the programmer, then run this transaction uh, and it yields a, a final transaction which is the composition of these two. Yes. Um, this one means if this one uh, ends up in a retry, which is called by the programmer, then do this. Yes. And otherwise, if there's a conflict uh, for the first transaction because another thread wrote to the same variables, uh, then this one gets a retry. So if this one ends up in a retry without any uh, contention uh, or uh, any uh, writes from other threads, then this one gets executed. Um, this one, if the programmer explicitly calls retry, we switch here. And if the programmer doesn't do a retry here, but the transaction fills because some other thread accessed memory, then this gets rerun, and it might end up in a retry, and then we do this. And if this one succeeds, uh, then this never happens. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
So I if this one ends up in a retry, uh, then yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, th this one is only looked at when this ends up in a retry. So th if this ends up in a retry, then we do this. And if this completes successfully, uh, then we're good. Then we're done. Uh, yeah, so uh, or else uh, augments the retry semantics. Uh, yes, it's discarded. Uh, it won't come back to the first one because Yes, exactly. But and yeah, that's true. Uh, except you don't really need to uh, have the recovery per se, as in a reversion step. Uh, in practice, you don't end up doing stuff like reversing previous effects in there because uh, the runtime undoes every effect by this one. Yeah, so you don't need to manually know. Uh, all right, this is all the previous work I've done. Uh, this is just a domain type of thing. If I try to buy a Ferrari and uh, I don't have enough money, then the transaction just doesn't complete instead of uh, perpetually retrying. Um, yeah, it, it, it can be a monoid. It, it's alternate, uh, alternative, actually. Yes, the second one can also keep stuck. Uh, can get stuck in a retry, and if that happens, then uh, the entire thing uh, is is rerun. Uh, yes. Yeah, you could uh, pretty easily create that. For example, if you, uh, as a combinator, I mean, like uh, say retry up to n times combinator, uh, uh, make a list of n items of that transaction and fold alternative uh, over it, and then you're done. Um, so this, yeah, so this augments the retry semantics. So it just instead of uh, changing uh, or keeping on the same thing, you can say, okay, uh, this is never going to complete. Uh, let's be done with this, right? Uh, uh, in case the uh, programmer calls retry, the entire thing gets uh, restarted. If there's a conflict there, uh, um, is some precedence uh, about what gets retried first, but uh, I'll need to look that up, sorry. Um, and yes. <laughs> um, it, yeah, it's the error handling mechanic here. Um, so it's not really an exception per se, but yeah, you can at any point in a nested transaction signal that 
uh, some domain uh, thing isn't good, and then you call retry, and then it gets retried until this succeeds. And if you don't want it to retry until it succeeds, then you uh, combine it with um, with a transaction that always completes successfully. Um, and you can also ret uh, return values out out of a transaction to indicate success or failure if you're interested in that. So, um, in and you can get it out using do notation or whatever because STM forms a mono. Uh, we'll see that in a bit, I think. So um, let's go to a transfer function which uh, doesn't per retry perpetually, right? Um, from and to and the amount are the same parameters and we define uh, the actual transfer uh, helper function which contains the same logic uh, that we saw previously and we uh, have the no op transaction which just returns uh, pure unit. Uh, this is an example of a transaction which always completes because uh, this one doesn't, uh, it, it cannot end up in a retry basically. Um, and uh, this is the alternative instance for STM as well, so you can import control dot applicative and uh, use this combinator, which you might be familiar with. If you're not, you can try it out. If uh, otherwise, you can use your or else, however you like. Um, and I have some final words about this before I want to get started with some exercises. Um, if there aren't any questions here. Yes, that's true. You cannot you cannot see the effect, but um, in in this case we could also uh, change the return type of STM to some sort of uh, uh, indication that it ran successfully, and that's actually an exercise I'm gonna gonna give to you in a bit. Um, some final words, right? Uh, as the sales pitch, um, STM gets us some atomic transactions for a shared memory. Uh, same control flow, in my opinion. Uh, there isn't any way in which your resource acquisition kind of stuff gets flipped inside out and your concurrent code gets encapsulated because of this. And uh, this helps avoid common locking problems and can help you with that. And it works by keeping a transaction log. It retries on conflicts for which there is uh, some semantics that I told you about. And it has three basic combinators, atomically retry and or else for the... Uh, alternative uh, instance. And it works in a variety of data types. We've here seen TVARs, but there's channels, queues, and a bunch of other stuff in the in the library. And we're actually going to be building some of those outside of, uh, out of these building blocks. Um, so as a final precaution, like SDM is not a silver bullet. It doesn't help you with all problems. You can still get yourself in deadlock type situations uh, using it. Uh, writing concurrent programs is still difficult and STM can take away some of the pain. One of the things I briefly mentioned is uh, contention as a potential problem here. Um, imagine you have some very long running transaction because it does a lot of computation. Uh, if at any point um, there is uh, another transaction which keeps interrupting uh, this very long running one, the very long running one might never actually complete because it uh, it repeatedly attempts to um, to to read and write uh, the variables which get polluted or there's conflict. So you can have starvation and that kind of stuff with SDM. Yes. Um, I think only uh, I think one gets chosen and then that one completes and then a bunch of others uh, can uh, can run and the reason this works is because of some implementation stuff that we're gonna gonna look at um, but that's for Wednesday I think uh, and another note uh, on the in this same area is that if your domain means that you have uh, if your domain is prone to uh, 
this kind of contention because let's say you have a hash map where uh, a lot of threads read and write to and from. If you just ra uh, wrap the hash map in a tvar, then you're going to have a lot of contention and your system is going to be slow. But there's a way around this by having a hash map of tvars. And uh, there, there are some cool packages uh, in the STM containers library that try to help you with some of these cases. So often, if you have this problem, it's uh, a matter of architecture. And you can sort of change your code to work around this. But it's, uh, it's, it's like a garbage collector. It this is something sometimes you need to know about the implementation and its internals in case you have performance problems. And this is one of those cases where it, this is just, yeah, it's a fundamental trade off in, in that sense. Yes? Hmm. That's a good one. We can experiment in a bit. I don't. I don't know per se. Uh, um, let's Google around in a bit. But uh, it's a good question. Um, so I mentioned the starvation and contention, uh, and it's time for some work. I've got a Bitly link for you. Um, it will redirect you to a gist, uh, which contains some uh, questions to check your understanding, and it contains some exercises that we can do in a bit. And then, um, let's see the time. Um, we have 15 more minutes before we have the lunch break, I think. So, um, if, if you want, you can dive into this, get set up, and then after lunch, we can uh, dive in properly, right? Right. Cheers. Thank you. All right. Um, so that's it for now from me. If y during the exercises you have any trouble, please raise your hand. I'll come. And uh, yeah, let's get started. <laughs>